Old School Lane Casual Chat is brought to you by Old School Lane, producing various content from blogs, videos, and podcasts discussing about movies, TV shows, video games, and everything else in between since 2011. You can check out the podcast on Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Radio Public, Overcast, Breaker, Pocket Cast, and YouTube. We're associated with Channel Frederator, Manic Expression, The Comic Book Cast, and The Aaron Meta Show. <laughs> everyone welcome to the first episode of casual chats for 2021 i am patricia and i am here with two very special guests uh, well actually three special guests with me so hi how you doing uh so yeah why don't you guys introduce yourselves uh i am andrew farrago a curator of the cartoon art museum in san francisco among other things i've written a lot of books on pop culture including comics and animation I'm uh, Shannon Garrity. I'm a cartoonist and comic book editor. Uh, I do an online comic called Skin Horse right now. And my first graphic novel, uh, Willow Weep Manor, uh, with the artist uh, Chris Baldwin, will be out this spring. And who are you? Robin. Mm -hmm. Hi, Robin. Our, our son Robin is here, too. Yes, uh, very nice to see you guys. And uh, we've actually had uh, Andrew on the show about, I would say, six years ago. We interviewed him for a podcast that my friend Kevin and I did called Turtle Talk, and we discussed about his TMNT book, uh, TMNT, hey. A Visual History. That was a lot of fun. That was, um, I, it was kind of a blur. It was actually right uh, around the time he was born, so I was talking Ninja Turtles and doing podcasts and doing 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> paper changes and things. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it, was a, it was a fun, crazy time. Yeah. So uh, today, uh, in honor of, uh, re just as, uh, as of the recording recently, uh, it would have been the 25th anniversary of the ending of the comic strip series Calvin and Hobbes. For those who don't know what Calvin and Hobbes is, it is a comic strip series that came from 1985 to 1995. It features a young six-year-old boy named Calvin and his uh, stuffed tiger named Hobbes, and they go through a lot of wacky adventures together, everything from their imaginations, pretending to be superheroes, and um, hanging out in their clubhouse, having snowball fights or just simply relaxing. He gets into some disagreements with his parents. He has a girl that he constantly makes fun of named Susie. He gets in trouble with his teacher. He has to deal with a bully. You know, your usual kid stuff. But uh, yeah, uh, it, it still has, even after 25 years after the comic strip series has ended, it still is regarded as one of the greatest comic strip series that has ever appeared in newspapers. Uh, even up there with Peanuts and um, the Garfield strip series as one of the top definitive ones and people still clamoring to this day for bill watterson to create more even though he said multiple times he will never do it <laughs> but no uh, right before we do uh discuss about uh, our thoughts of calvin and hobbs uh, how did you first get introduced to it calvin and hobbs was just um everywhere when i was growing up i was in the generation that was growing up in the 80s and 90s um right around the time it started and I and Andrew too. We actually were both from, a, both grew up in Ohio, and um, that's where I was when uh, Calvin and Hobbes came out. Bill Watterson is from Ohio mm -hmm. as well, and I think a lot of the first papers that picked it up were in that area. So I think my newspaper got it like pretty early on, because uh, I remember reading it from possibly from the start, and definitely from very early. Mm -hmm. So it was just something I read the new, I, you know, I learned to read by reading comic strips in the newspaper, among other things. And Calvin and Hobbes, when that showed up, it was uh, just became part of my daily routine. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember. It, was, it wasn't some thunderbolt out of the sky mm -hmm. moment when I first 
saw it. I know that I read it. Um, I read the newspaper comics every day, so as soon as it showed up, I would have been reading it. Uh, but I kind of, I kind of, you know, I'd say the first two years, I'm not sure I was completely aware of it, but around year two, year three, the book collections started coming out. And those were like the Garfield books um, earlier in my school days. Those were highly coveted items at the school <laughs> library. Um, kids beg their parents for them. I remember that was, I think, around sixth or seventh grade. That was a back to school um, present where I just, I begged my mom at the, at the mall, like, please, please, please let me get my own Calvin and Hobbes book that I can, uh, that I can have. And, you know, it's one of those things that I, I read cover to cover and all the kids at my school were really into it. And that's, mm -hmm. that's an exciting thing that doesn't happen with a lot of comic strips anymore. There are definitely some popular ones. I absolutely see some strips that kids multiple kids are crazy about right uh but it felt like it was such totally mainstream entertainment for you know any middle school junior high kid um when i was that age like just yeah lots of lots of calvin and Hobbes fans <laughs> in my school yeah um, as for me, I probably was first introduced to it with uh, the newspapers because I probably was um, familiar with a lot of the comic strips that were on the papers. I would have been seeing like the Peanuts and the Garfield comic strips and Beetle Bailey and Hagger the Horrible and various others. But uh, yeah, definitely Calvin and Hobbes was one that kind of just stood out. Uh, one fact that uh, we'll get into a little bit later on is that every Sunday they would just have these incredibly large, detailed, colored strips discussing about, okay, there's this giant dinosaur roaming around, and then all of a sudden it pops into Calvin, you know, um, going around the living room, and then his mom would be yelling, stop doing that, and stuff like that. So, and then he would just say some rhetorical, smart alecky statement that a six-year-old would clearly never say but you know what let's just fall into this universe you know, <laughs> whatever anyway so I guess I have I was familiar with it but I wasn't um, as fully invested in it until like much later on when I did see the Calvin and Hobbes collection I probably would have been around uh, I think it was around high school so definitely around the early 2000s in which the love of Calvin and Hobbes never really went away so I think that when uh, that approach with, you know, more people wanting to get the collection and more people reading into it and then doing like a whole bunch of retrospectives of comic strips about the quote unquote rise and fall of it and saying that Calvin and Hobbes was like the last great comic strip and nothing will ever replace it and stuff like that until uh, I guess with the advent of the internet, we would have like more indie comic strips, um, which... Um, I guess is to be expected, you know, with uh, the way that things are changing. Uh, just not too long ago, I actually interviewed uh, somebody who is creating her own uh, comic book series. Um, if you are interested in checking it out, uh, Kat Kalamia is doing her comic book series, Like Father, Like Daughter, which the Kickstarter had just ended, and uh, issue number seven will be coming out really soon. So that still is going strong. But when it comes to um, mainstream comic strips, I mean, I guess they'll still you know, recirculate the same things over and over again. But I, I mean, I don't know because I'm not in the world of the comic strips or uh, any of that kind of stuff like you guys are. So I don't know, has any like massive mainstream comic strip series over the past 10 plus years has really like changed pop culture the way it is? Well, it's a really different world now because newspapers are not ubiquitous anymore. Sure. So it's, it's really hard for a newspaper comic strip to have the kind of, uh, impact and the kind of uh, reach that um, strips did in the 80s and 90s. Um, there's a lot of, there's definitely comic strips that are still very successful in the newspapers and like moving more and more online these days. Uh, what do you think, Andy? Right, you've been, you've been in web comics for 20 yeah, years. Yeah, I do. 20 years since the early days. Yeah, yeah, I do online comic strips. I have for a long time. But yeah, there's been a, there's been a sea change. It used to be, uh, you know, there's there's kind of a guaranteed living if you could get a 
good syndication deal. And if you made it through that first year, you would pick up enough papers that you could do that. Mm -hmm. um, you could do that as your full-time profession. And now uh, the syndicates are, they're launching fewer and fewer strips. Fewer of them are getting picked up by enough newspapers to be viable that way. There are absolutely strips that are um, successful that have done, um, let's see, stri strips that run online only, and strips that run, uh, strips that are syndicated, but are syndicated, um, you know, syndicated through sites like Go Comics, yeah. which uh, Shannon's on, strips yeah. that are syndicated, mm -hmm. um, you know, in other ways. I mean, it is a very different world, and there are definitely comic strips that are very big, like Quirrells Before Swine is, is really big. It's a big following. Lots of kids love it. Fox yeah. Rock. Um, and there are lots of new strips coming along and, like, new versions of strips that are, com that are out there that are really cool. They've been, the syndicates have been relaunching some of, like, the old legacy strips, like, uh, like Nancy, uh, with new <laughs> artists, and it's, it's really fun to see different people reinvent it, but, um, it's true, it's a very different world than it was when everybody got the newspaper every yeah. day. Yeah, exactly. I have been seeing a resurgence of comic strips um, that has been around for a very long time. In fact, there's even announcements of saying like Peanuts is going to be getting its own series on Apple TV. Hagar the Horrible is going to be getting a se its own series. That's the characters. That's not really the strips. Yeah, so nobody, that's, that's, yeah. Been the, that's been the issue that newspaper readership has shifted. So it's, it's largely online. Mm -hmm. People follow um which is good it, it, which is good and bad instead of you know you you subscribe to your one newspaper in the city and you get some of the comic strips but not others right yeah, and it's so a good thing that you can follow every single comic strip you want now. yeah so comic book re uh, comic strip readership is now largely online or in book collections and like actually there are some comics are doing very some strips are doing very well in book collections um because there's a like people are getting a lot more interested in having in comics as a way for kids to read and for teens to read. So like um, Dana Simpson's uh, strip Phoebe and her unicorn, um, I think is doing, it's a, she's, it's a newspaper, it's a daily strip, but I think she's done extraordinarily well in like the book collections of it. I've yeah. heard a lot about that. I've heard some yeah. really good things on it. It's that's really that's, great. That's why the kids know her and her work. Yeah, they that's know. right. Cause there are books available. They know the book collections, they get them again, school library, scholastic book fair. Mm -hmm places like that yeah oh yeah the scholastic book fair yes i remember those oh the scholastic book fair is, is amazing because it it's a rare opportunity for publishers to market <laughs> directly to kids mm -hmm. um so it's and which is very unusual because normally children's books are sold to the adults that buy for children rather than for children directly exactly so, yeah scholastic has a huge advantage with the book club and that's been really good for their, their comics line, their graphic novels and their uh, comic strip collections. I'd yeah. say in a way, I'd almost compare it to what's happened with broadcast television, mm -hmm. where in the, probably kind of around the same time, it used, it used, to, be, uh, used to be kind of guaranteed that everybody watched you know, the NBC Thursday night lineup. Or at least right. like a significant percentage of people. Yeah. And you knew if you made a if you made a reference to last night's episode of Friends or Seinfeld that on Friday um, people watched it with you and they, they knew what you were talking about. And those are the last shows that was really true for. And so these these uh, so the comic strips um, when when you had Calvin and Hobbes, when you had the far side, when you had Bloom County, um, these were these were strips that kids talked about. I'm mm -hmm. sure some adults, teens, yeah. college kids read them too. Yeah. And, you know, if you drop a Calvin Ball reference to somebody in Generation X or the kids who read them in book collections, they know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. If you drop a, if you drop a same reference from um, yesterday's Pearls Before Swine mm -hmm. or Leo, uh, you're, you're probably not going to get quite that same reaction. Uh, especially since there is um, a way for people to look back on these more so than ever. I mean, you know, like you were saying that now because we're in the digital age, you know, you have the official social medias or even unofficial social medias of comic strips uh, like Calvin and Hobbes in which, you know, every day they would be posting up like one strip right. of 
a comic book, uh, a comic strip, and then they will be looking into it and then they'll be, you know, putting in a response and then it will, you know, it will spread all over social media. And then a lot of people would be looking more into it. And then they'll uh, follow in the works of Bill Watterson. And then eventually they'll get to the point in which they are invested in Calvin and Hobbes. And then they'll probably look for more similar comic strips. Yeah, I think I even discussed about this a few years ago with uh, a friend of mine who used to discuss about comic strips on his YouTube channel. He doesn't do it anymore. He's long since decided to uh, take a break from his YouTube career. But uh, we even discussed a similar thing uh, about Bone where... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, where, uh, you know, where you were saying earlier about the Scholastic Book Fair in which, like, that was one of the comic strip series that a lot of people were, like, you know, or comic book series that people right. were like, really into in which uh, they would, like, collect every single volume of the series. And it got to the point at which it was so popular they wanted to make a movie off of it, but then it never happened because of uh, creative differences. So... You have a lot to say about that. <laughs> Not that much. Oh. Yeah, that was, and that's another with Scholastic publishes bone right yeah they have they do collections of bone that's still a pretty big seller with uh, kids as far as i know yeah they yeah. They, um, they proudly proclaim on the cover um you know millions of copies mm -hmm. in print and wow. that is that's not because of us mm -hmm. who like we we bought it at the lo we bought it at our local comic shops mm -hmm. Uh, in the 90s as it was coming out and in the 2000s uh -huh. we're not the reason that there are millions of copies in print it's because jeff yeah. smith um realized if we put this in color if we serialize it if we do nice really nice sturdy yeah, paperback editions for kids, kids reading it. um that it, it went through the stratosphere mm -hmm. once kids discovered it once kids were reading it yeah um, you know, we've read it to our son and he yeah. loves it. And it's, um, yeah, like as, as much as, 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 as big as that comic book got based on just, just, you know, uh, mainstream comic book readership, it exploded. Yeah. It discovered it. Right, right. Anyway, so yeah, I guess we'll um, go into uh, Calvin and Hobbes. So yeah, I would say, uh, what were your favorite um, moments of Calvin and Hobbes? Ooh, that's such a tough question. There's so many great moments. Um, I know there's I a lot of great moments. I agree with you that the Sunday, a lot of the Sunday strips were gorgeous. And that was something Bill Watterson really fought for. Um, you know, at the time, comic strip pages were shrinking a lot. And um, most cartoonists had to do Sunday strips that could be cut down to size and rearrange the panels rearranged to fit different page dimensions and uh, Watterson reached a point where he like dug in his heels and refused to do that anymore and um, you know the syndicate let him go with it and like newspapers agreed that like they're not going to mess with the Calvin and Hobbes Sunday and that allowed him to do like big full page um, picture illustrations and elaborate layouts and that's when he got like started getting really creative with the Sunday art. Yeah, and they knew, um, you know, it was a, it was a contentious relationship with him and the syndicate. But they knew he was very serious about his art. He wanted, uh, and I respect him like crazy for that. That mm -hmm. he wanted it always to be about the art. And he, you know, he told them, "I'm taking a sabbatical. I don't know when I'm coming back. That I'm happened, gonna come yeah. back when I'm recharged." And when he came back, he said. You know, I want to do these amazing Sunday strips that I was not able to do before. And he, that's, that's one of the cases where he threw around his weight. He said, if you want Bill Watterson doing Calvin and Hobbes, uh, please make this concession. Please let me do this. Uh, and they, they made it happen. Um, even some comic strip artists at the time grumbled because mm -hmm. they, the, they said, you know, if they can't chop up your strip, then you're going to bump somebody else off mm -hmm. the comics page. Um, but you know he's he stood his ground he said i'm I'm all about the strip i do not want to sell toys i don't want to do a movie i don't want to do anything else oh, oh oh we'll get to that and we'll get to that, we'll get to that yeah um so i respect that but yeah if you're talking favorite moments there are um you know i've again with with our son i've reread it a lot and there's so many great aspects like i don't know i don't know that i pick out single strips but well you don't have to but I like, you know, I love, you know, Calvin, the inventor, mm -hmm. and Hobbes, the, 
you know, Hobbes, the voice of reason, but only to an extent because, mm -hmm. um, you know, he's, he's the voice of reason as far as a six year old can, um, com yeah, compared to a bouncing off the walls, a genius, <laughs> um, occasionally difficult six year old can have a voice of reason in his life. Uh, but yeah, the inventions, the, um, I identify with his parents a lot more when yeah. I this trip. Like, like, <laughs> as, a kid, as a kid, obviously, I identified, like, I got into Calvin's head and knew where he was coming from, and now I read it from the parents' point of view, and it's like, those poor... Those poor <laughs> <people>. <laughs> yeah. I always like, I always liked any transmogrifier story. Oh, wow. Transmogrifier was great, especially if, um, it gave, it gave Watterson a chance to draw, like, different animals and things, which I always enjoyed. Um, it's not until you see, like, He's so little of his art outside of Calvin and Hobbes has really been seen by the public that it's always interesting when you see him draw anything that isn't like the main cast of Calvin and Hobbes or one of his like Sunday fantasies. So like Calvin turning into like an owl and like a crocodile and stuff and they're kind of cartoony and pogo like was all very nice. You may have an answer here, Robin. What's well, your Oh yeah, Robin, yeah. what's do you have a favorite Calvin and Hobbes strip? No, not really, but just like you, I do, I do, well, but also just like you, I do like the Chantuaga higher steps. Yeah. Do you ever um, get in a cardboard box and pretend it's something else? One time I got in a, one time when I was younger, I got in a cardboard box and pretended it was a car. When you were younger. Yeah, mm -hmm. just like that. <laughs> when you were younger. <laughs> and how old are you again? Six and a half. Six and a half. Wow. What do you, you're a big man now. <laughs> the same age as Calvin. Get yeah, same age as video Calvin. game. <laughs> okay. I'll have fun with that. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's really interesting about how, you know, it would have been so easy for Bill Watterson to write Calvin as just your stereotypical little kid, just acting like a little kid, just you know, a mindset of what a typical little kid is. It's like, you know, he, he does have the imagination and he does have his distaste and uninterest in hanging out with girls. And he does have his rivalry with his school bully and his disconnect with his parents. But he's also very intelligent too. I mean, every time that he gets really angry about something, then, you know, he would always say to Hobbes, uh, you know, he would like offset something regarding about, uh, you know, like basically like, uh, you know, why is this world uh, filled with cynical people? Uh, I just don't understand how they can be able to work this way or something like that. I think that, um, you know, I, going back into what you were saying about the parents. Yeah. I mean, I, I do, I do find them hilarious looking back on, uh, you know, looking back on the strips as an adult, it's like, how are they able to put up with him? It's like, he's just as smart, if not even smarter than they are. He can say a whole bunch of rhetorical quips, but since they're the parents, they can be able to out, outsmart him. Mm -hmm. And I think there was this one strip that I saw the other day because it's winter time. And he was uh, saying, you know, I'm bored. I want to be able to do something. And then his dad says, well, well, uh, why don't you go outside and shovel snow? Um, you know, you can be able to work out your muscles and your blood. And then Calvin, uh, because he was acting, you know, he was cold and he wanted his dad to turn up the, the heat. And then he decided to wear a sweater. And he's like, so are you feeling warm now? And then he's just grumbled and just walked away. Bill Watterson, like, um, is very inspired by peanuts and like the kids in peanuts also speak in a very precocious adult-like way yeah uh, very much so i think the big difference between the two strips is that the kids in peanuts talk like adults and calvin talks like uh, like a kid's idea of how they talk of how they talk like right. I, I always thought calvin talks like a kid's own inner idea of when they of that they're sounding intelligent and making good points and things because he definitely he has a very childlike perspective um, but it's very good, but it's extremely articulate expressing it. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, there you have moments in which, you know, he claims that he's above his education, and then he just talks to his teacher, Miss Wormwood, saying, you know, why do I even need this? I, I, I already know everything that I need to know, and then she just continues to give him straight up Fs, uh, yeah. and saying, see me after class. That's one, yeah, we relate to that with our kid now, because he constantly tells us that he's too smart and doesn't need to learn anything. <laughs> <laughs> right that and, yeah uh, yeah he does yeah yeah but yeah it's, they're they're um you know it's fun it's it's um you know he's he's a 
typical six-year-old in some ways and then not in others. Mm -hmm. And um, Peanuts kids are like that. Like they, um, and I felt, you know, I felt the same way. I really related to the Peanuts characters even more than the Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, than Calvin, like I related to the Peanuts well, characters. Well, you related to Charlie Brown. Yeah, you like I related to them as a kid, and I thought, I, I think this is how I'm expressing myself. I think <laughs> yeah. this is how I'm coming off to adults. Uh, yeah. I will say, yeah, if it's, if it's um, comic strip recommendation time, everybody who loves Calvin and Hobbes and Peanuts uh, needs to track down a comic strip called Cul-de-Sac mm -hmm. by Richard Oh, Tom. I've heard, I, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that one, yeah. Yeah, and that is... I think that's the best, most realistic depiction of kids in a comic strip. Like he's, it's a, um, you know, it's a preschooler mm -hmm. and her um, sort of around middle school aged brother, um, Alice and Petey. And Petey is like even, as much as I thought Charlie Brown was me in a comic strip, <laughs> Petey from Cul de Sac is. That's is, really scary because Petey's very neurotic. He's yeah. depressed and neurotic. Yeah, like I can, um, you know, and I talked to Richard about this, like just mm -hmm. how much I really related to that character. And he did such a perfect job of uh, capturing kids. And again, having yeah. had a preschool in our house, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the weirdness and the zaniness and the perspective of, of a four-year-old discovering the world. Yeah, uh, and I know he, Bill... He nailed that one. Yeah, and I know Bill Watterson's a big fan of Call to Sack and of Richard Thompson's work. Oh, nice. He's, yeah. Yeah, uh, and I, I, I also know that he is... Um, he is I, from what I understand, and, you know, uh, on the very rare interviews that he does, that he does still read comic strips. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know um, if he particularly i mean other than like a handful of them i don't know if if he's like fully invested in some of them as much as he would have been in the uh, previous comic strips but i do know that he still reads them from time to time i haven't had really direct contact with him i ha i know i've got friends who are in contact with him and we know editors and publishers who um work with him and he's mm -hmm. just uh, he's just always been a very private yeah, person. Sure. Yeah, he's very nice. He just wants his privacy. Of course. I mean, does everybody does, to be quite honest. And most I think... People, most people don't, and that's one of the things I respect about him, is he, he really is not interested in being any kind of celebrity. Bill Sorry, just a second. <laughs> what? what is it? <laughs> oh, Bill Warner's going to dress Drew Calvin and Hobbes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, so he, he um, you know, one of his rare... Actually, it's the first time anybody had seen comics from him in forever. Was mm -hmm. he? He came out of retirement to do a few um, mm -hmm. strips of Pearls Before Swine. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I know about that one, and I think I also know that he did some work for an, a documentary about comic strips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so you, you can. He does a little phone interview, so you can hear his voice. Yeah, in the, uh, Shannon's in this. It's a documentary mm -hmm. called Stripped. That's what I was referring to, yeah. He, yeah. he did that. I think he did an illustration for the, the cover for that. You know, he's done a, he did a poster for a festival. Mm -hmm. I think maybe the Angoulême Comics Festival in France. Um, so it's, it's, been, it's been little things. Like I, I can actually name all of them. Like he did a, he did a <laughs> painting for the, the uh, uh, when Richard Thompson was battling Parkinson's, mm -hmm. he did a, a painting of pd mm -hmm. the lead the lead character from cul-de-sac mm -hmm. that was auctioned off so that's you know less than a half dozen you know and it sounds like bigfoot sightings when you list them <laughs> off like that but, <laughs> you know he's done that he's done a few interviews but um yeah not not much he just he just he's content to let the strip mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can I can respect that. I mean, I guess if you know he were to be very similar to previous comic strip creators, if he were to be a Jim Davis, then he would market everything yeah. with Calvin and Hobbes. Or if he was like Charles Schultz, you know, he'd be working with the comic strips for a long time, do a few TV specials here and there. No, he decided that uh, you know he was going to be doing his um, uh, comic strips for ten years. 
he was done and he decided to go back into his uh, private life uh, doing painting. And then I'm sure that, you know, as soon as that was done, I'm sure comic strip, um, you know, newspapers were like scrambling to try to find the next Calvin and Hobbes because they didn't know what to do afterwards. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I was just, again, with the 25th anniversary, I've had opportunity to talk about this, but uh, there hasn't been a next Calvin and Hobbes. And what was really yeah. something really, um, and I, 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 I spent time thinking about this. I can't think of another example, but um, uh, 1995 was the year that uh, January 1st, Gary Larson ended the far mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. Uh, in March, uh, Berkeley Breath had ended Outland, which was the sequel, Sunday only strip that was a sequel to Bloom County. And uh, December 31st, you had Bill Watterson ending Calvin and Hobbes. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's three all time great Hall of Fame cartoonists, you know, at their peak, mm -hmm. probably, probably peak number of newspapers. Um, peak, peak newspaper circulation um, in their prime as far as their cartooning abilities. Uh, but all three of them were just saying like, I'm not, I, I don't feel, I don't feel like being creative on a deadline on a regular basis. I'm not, if I keep this up, I'm not going to enjoy it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and all three of them, and I'm, I'm sure the newspaper editors all went gray overnight, losing, oh, yeah. losing that much. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for cartoonists, it's great that because that's that's an opportunity to get pick up thousands of newspapers if if somebody had come along with the right strip right, right. then. And there have been comics. There have been um, Boondocks, another great strip mm -hmm. that came and went. Mm -hmm. uh, Pearls Before Swine. Like there have been terrific comics that have come along and have claimed a lot of real estate in the newspapers. Right. But not really anything on that cultural level again of those those three and i can't imagine um uh, I, I talked about television earlier and you know cheers and seinfeld and friends didn't leave the air mm -hmm. you know at the during the same season and um basketball michael jordan and magic johnson and larry bird didn't all walk away um from the game at the same time like there, there aren't these seismic shifts like that. That's true. Uh, I can't think of, and definitely not in comic strips, but comic books, music. Uh, I can't think of three major mm -hmm. dominating <laughs> forces like that who were just, you know, that good, that talented, that beloved, um, that impactful, and all just within the space of a year just walking away yeah i i i take it that um the fact that three of those just went away in that same year mm -hmm. that there was like this huge amount of stress to find the next big hit and well there was some that came and went i mean i guess for a lot of people it's like comic strips just weren't the same again and the fact that it was you know 1995 and the advent of the internet was just starting i guess it was kind of like a way of shifting from one direction to another in terms of how we present our media. Yeah. We, and as opposed to paper, we do it online. And even with um, the way that people present things, it's completely different. Like, you know, uh, imagine, you know, having to draw from paper a strip every single day and then having to do like six strips on a Sunday. So that must have been like really, really time consuming and very That's hard. What I do, man, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I do a daily yes, I do a daily comic strip. It is very time consuming. Yeah. Uh, that's an understatement, I know. <laughs> and, and even the as same as thing as the shifting habits go, mm -hmm. I'll say uh, I was I was actually in college when those ended. Mm -hmm. So I was um, you know, I didn't have access to that daily newspaper. Mm -hmm. Um uh, you know, that I got, um, you know, that my parents still get uh, at home. And, um, you know, that really, that really broke my habit. Like when I, when I would visit at home during the summer, um, you know, I'd still read the newspaper comics, but mm -hmm. there's less, um, there's less urgency. Like there's mm -hmm. less urgency of 
what's going on in Calvin and Hobbes today. Does this pick up from that fun storyline that was still going earlier in this week? Uh, what's what's going to be the gag in Farside today? Mm -hmm. There's absolutely less urgency. So, Yeah, Calvin and Hobbes ended in, I think, my senior year of high school, and I now realize I don't know enough about what was going on in the newspaper comic strip market immediately after that because I went off to college and wasn't reading a newspaper. <laughs> um, right. And that was, yeah, it also, so I got, I wasn't paying attention to what was happening in the newspaper strips. And also in college, I got into web comics. I started reading comics online. Yeah. So I kind of transitioned immediately to this, this other world that was starting up. Yeah, I, I, I definitely do um, concur as well, where a lot of the stuff was being posted online. I remember that uh, you have the Penny Arcade comics were becoming yep. really popular, and uh, Pearls Before Swine became really popular online, and um, even the old syndicated strips started coming online for the first time, so a lot of people looked into that. So I, I know that, uh, and uh, as we mentioned earlier about Bone, in which um, around uh, through 2004, where Jeff Smith was being interviewed by Ain't It Cool News. Uh, that was one of the first websites that was into like discussing about pop culture media, oh, where yeah. it was discussing about, um, hey, did you ever try to do, um, you know, a continuation? Did you want to do a continuation of Bone? Or, you know, what was the inspiration for that? Uh, tell us about that Bone movie that never came out. So, yeah, that was when more people started to get to know more about uh, people behind the scenes and people uh, discussing about how they were able to do comics strips and about the massive changes from doing it in the papers as opposed to doing it online. I mean, even with um, manga artists, it's the same thing in which, you know, having to draw 18 page script, um, you know, strips every single week. And yep. that's absolutely grueling. Nowadays, you do it once a month because the amount of times that you have to do it was overwhelming to the point at which some people got, ex you know, extreme burnout. So oh, it still happens. Uh, yeah. Most, yeah. I mean, most manga magazines are still weekly. It's intense. Yeah. Uh, I guess, I guess, you know, depending on um, the, the, the comic strip, it's still a daily basis. They still yeah. have to update it on a daily basis. So it's still incredibly time consuming and very, um, you know, tight within uh, when you have to turn it in, which I'm sure is very stressful, especially I'm sure for Watterson, who actually has stories in his comic strips, where a lot of them were probably self-contained. I mean, sure, there was like some story beats here and there, but a lot of the strips, you need to find out what happened in the story in order for you to know about what's going on with Calvin or Hobbes or his mom or Susie or his dad or the teacher or anything like that. So yeah, that's how, um, in, so you have to have a storyline and then you probably mm -hmm. have to think of like six other stories that way you can be able to follow up with that. Or maybe you want a self-contained story one week. So yeah, that, that must've been not really easy. So I can see why a lot of people decided, okay, I've done it for this long, I'm gonna stop. It's pretty intense, and I like the idea of just stopping a comic strip when you're done having fun drawing that comic strip, or when you've told the story that, that you want to tell. There's actually been, like, a number of other comic strip writers have retired since then, like, you know, uh, Lynn Johnston retired, uh, for better or for worse, and Kathy Guyswhite retired Kathy. There are lots mm -hmm. of other, and, um, there seems to be, a, there seems to be a movement towards artists just ending mm -hmm. a comic strip when they're done with it, rather than passing it on to another artist, which does happen sometimes, but it seems to be it they, they seems to be a little less common. They're more yeah, a little more obscure. Uh, Bill Bill Amon, who draws Foxtrot, mm -hmm. um, he he wanted to switch to Sundays only. Mm -hmm. Still doing that because um, he he likes the characters. He was having fun with it, but uh, the daily workload it's a grind. Too much. So that was his way. Um, and Berkeley Breath had you know paved the way for that. He's the one who. Um, Again, he never, he, he always just barely, he said whatever deadline you gave him, he would hit that deadline exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. And he burned himself out after was, a decade of that. Yeah, and that was really nerve wracking for editor, because um, at the time. He would ink comic strips in taxi cabs on the way to the yeah, airport. Yeah, on airplanes, so he could hand yeah. Them off to a yeah. courier at the airport at, at the last possible minute. At that time, in the 80s and 90s, comic strips had to be, I think, six weeks ahead of schedule. It was different for dailies and Sundays, but they had to be comfortably ahead of schedule. Nowadays, um, when you can send things digitally, it's not quite as, as you know, you can get a tighter deadline going, but like right. back then, yeah. He, getting... was just, he was just shy of moving to 
his syndicate's <laughs> city so that he could be, you know, next door to the building. And not have to mail things. And and just, just draw it the second that it was due. And that's just how he worked. That was mm -hmm. his approach to deadlines. Uh, Watterson, again, there's, there's something to be said for if you've, you've had a successful run, people like what you've mm -hmm. done. Um, you know, some, some people are going to be the Rolling Stones and they're going to go out there and we've got, you know, 50 years of hits. We've got, you know, we've got three hours worth of songs that everybody knows and enjoys that we could just keep doing, you know, forever. Uh -huh. um, some people are going to do that and some people are just going to say, I, I did this, I enjoyed it. Um, and I, I had someone ask, someone said to me the other day, like, um, well, Wat Watterson, like he probably had another two or three years in him. And I don't know that he did. If he, if he wasn't having fun, if he knew, uh -huh. um, you know, better to go out while people like this rather than, um, you know, all, all people, all, you know, I, as much as I would love to have an extra Calvin and Hobbes paper book on the bookshelf, paperback on the bookshelf, it would be, um, if he didn't want to do it, if it was just going to be going through the motions, if it was just going to be, you know, it's, 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 it's actually like every time uh, there's a new Star Wars or a James Bond or something, like if it's, it's got to be close enough to what you remember and what you enjoyed and if you steer too far off of that, um, people are going to rebel and get upset. Oh so, yeah, <laughs> you you have you definitely have a point there. And your run of the comic strip mm -hmm. minus his one-year sabbatical, yeah. and um, it fits nice, nicely in a box set. I am a big <laughs> fan of things being as long as they need to be. Yeah, when it's time to end, it's time to end. Then sometimes that can just be that you feel like it's time. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, it'll be just z zombie mode. It's like you're just doing it for the sake of doing it. And then it's just not as good as it used to be. And then you're wondering, why is this still going? And you're just praying for it to end. And then Charles, Charles Schultz, meanwhile, he just kept did going until he died. 50 years yep. until he, um, you know, he, he died not long after he physically couldn't draw or mm -hmm. do the strip anymore. Died right. shortly after the last strip ran. The day, yeah, within 24 hours of the last yeah. trip papers, he passed away. And, right. you know, there's, there's something beautiful and poetic mm -hmm. about that. And I, there are things I love about every single era, every single year of Peanuts. Of peanuts yeah. And I'm glad he did it. Because um, obvious, obviously, uh, from a financial standpoint, any time after the 60s, he could have said, you know, I've had, I, you know, I don't have to do this anymore. Um, and he could have, he could have just golfed and played tennis mm -hmm. and, and um, been a retiree with an interesting story about like, oh, what, what was your <laughs> line of work? So he obviously did it because he wanted to. Um, Jim Davis is still involved in the story meetings and discussions and to the agree. day to day <laughs> yeah. for Garfield. And he's, um, it's like it's, 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 he's a small business owner, basically. Yeah, and you know he, he does it. He does it in his different way, mm -hmm. but like you said, Lynn Johnston, Kathy Guyswhite, other people said, yeah. "That's enough." Yeah, we're done. I did it. We'll let the kids come along and give mm -hmm. them some space in the newspaper and, and see what they can do with it. Yeah, and I guess now would be a nice little way to segue into uh, what people have been demanding for the longest time is more merchandise of Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> No, and I love that. You know, I think one of the things that I think people really respond to in Calvin and Hobbes is that Bill Watterson seems to have a very clear idea of what he wants it to be and what he wants to say with it. And that includes like not doing anything that is not the comic strip. And I really admire that about him. Yeah. So, I mean, other than the unofficial Calvin stickers that you see in the car. <laughs> that is the downside of it is that the most, pro the most since he does, there is no official merchandise you know, the, the, the biggest, the, the emergency most identified with Calvin and Hobbes is Calvin peeing on things. <laughs> you know, he's yes. seen that. I don't oh, know. he's seen it. I really have to, I really have to ask our, I have to ask the mutual friend if like, and this is probably the last time he would actually, actually ever be able to call Watterson. So I'm sure he won't ask him. <laughs> he will not, that's not But true. I want to know if Watterson drives a Ford or a Chevy because... <laughs> 
That's what Calvin, Calvin that's what the Calvin stickers are always going at. They're always peeing on rival car logos. Yeah. Yeah, like which like which one is on Waterson's car is what I want to but um you know the I think because of that integrity because you said it's it's just the books it's mm -hmm. all it's only ever going to be the books um because of that um kids who never mm -hmm. kids who've never seen a newspaper <laughs> kids who've never read a newspaper know and love Calvin and Hobbes mm -hmm. and those books um because the um, because it's so timeless, because there weren't a million topical references in the strip, because it's it's just a kid being a kid. Mm -hmm. um, Twenty five years from now, we'll still be we'll still be reading them. Yeah, we definitely will. And I think that one of the things that was really inspiring for Bill, uh, in addition to creating Calvin and Hobbes, was when he did the graduation speech. Right. Yeah. I mean, where he was talking about just, you know, go out there and be creative. Don't worry about, um, you know, fighting for your dreams because, you know, I had to fight for my dreams as well. And, you know, I became a success. So, you know, I, I think I even still see, you know, that, um, that speech around online, you know, from time to time, especially for those who are either about to graduate or for those who are wondering about, should I even do this thing? Because I know realistically, it's not going to make me as much money or I'm not going to get as much benefits or I won't be able to support a family or support myself or something like that. But no, I, I think that in reality, I think that what's really amazing is that Calvin Hobbes is able to be that spark of creativity and imagination that people really gravitate to. And a guy like Bill Watterson is able to showcase that, yes, you can be able to do anything that you want to, as long as you put in the hard work and passion and have the imagination for you to do something like that. I will say, um, yeah, I should mention, and there, there are a few books like this, my absolute favorite Calvin and Hobbes collection is the 10th anniversary book. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if, yeah, if I were only going to have one, that's the one I would keep. And that is, uh, it's a collection of Watterson's favorite Calvin and Hobbes strips. Not quite all the way up to the end, but um, through the last few years. And, and, no, no, okay. Right up through the final years. And it's, it includes um, running commentary from mm -hmm. Watterson where he's just talking about this is what worked about this strip. This is what didn't. This is this is what was going through my head. Um, and then he, you get this rare insight into, again, very rare insight into him because he talks mm -hmm. about, like, I was miserable when I drew this because, and this was this is me, in my passive aggressive way, lashing out at the syndicate <laughs> um, in this yeah. strip because I'm this one. This one is about creativity. This one's about commercialism. Mm -hmm. This is complaining about the constraints of the newspaper comics page. Uh, so there's a, there's that book. There's yeah, I'm a uh, sucker for any comic strip collection that has commentary. There's on a it. Far Side 10th Anniversary that collection really where good. Gary Larson does the same yeah. thing. These are modeled after um, I think the prototype for all. Uh, yeah, prototype. I don't know the the um, the Ur text. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> these these all spring from uh, some Walt Kelly collections like. Oh, 10 yeah. over 11 blue ideas of pogo yeah that's the classic and that's such a good um, collection uh where he does the same thing so it's his mm -hmm. it's his commentary along with his comics and you mm -hmm. get this this peek behind the curtain yeah. and um i'm looking over at my bloom county hardcover collections which mm -hmm. um just came out from idw about 10 years ago and those mm -hmm. have running commentary from berkeley breath about mm -hmm. um about the comic and what was going through his head when he was doing these, but yeah. sure, yeah, track down the tenth anniversary Calvin and Hobbes book um, because he he goes through this and you um, you do get you do get this explanation and it's it's great to hear in his own words why um, like I didn't want to I didn't want to decide Calvin's reality by mm -hmm. um, putting out a Hobbes doll and mm -hmm. I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to do this. I didn't want mm -hmm. Calvin to be a pitch man for Coca-Cola or mm -hmm. uh, Levi's or anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, or even have an animated series on something like Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network right. or, yeah. or the USA Network, whatever I, that would have been. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, like I, I, I can imagine like what would Calvin or Hobbes sound like. I mean, especially if it was that time mm-hmm. period, like yeah. around the '90s. Like I would think that they'll probably have Calvin voiced by either a little boy, an actual little kid, or maybe like a female voice actress trying to act like a little boy, something akin to like Kath Susie or E.G. Daly or Tara Strong. And then Hobbes, I, I can't imagine what Hobbes would sound like. To be quite honest, mm-hmm. that's actually a really they're, tough one because I was. Absolutely, uh, you know, we we live in a world where there are some absolutely brilliant animators and um, artists and voice actors, and I know there are people who would, given the opportunity, I know there are people who would do the best possible. Calvin and Hobbes animated movie you could ever imagine. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, if the Peanuts movie can say anything, then, you know, if you get the right people, if you get the right company to do it, and you put in the same amount of effort as you would with the comic strips and give, um, you know, homage to it, as well as references and, you know, doing a great story, then absolutely. I'm sure that a Calvin and Hobbes movie would be fantastic, but, you know, that's... You know, I'm content to wait a hundred years for Calvin and Hobbes to enter the public domain <laughs> no. and let people let people oh, then gosh. deal with it. Like if they sure. can if we're if we're all just heads in jars and we get to watch the uh, I, <laughs> Yeah, like Futurama, months. right. Yeah. But I'm I, I for now, um yeah, I one hundred percent respect um you know you know, and he could, he could even, he could wake up tomorrow and say, you know what, I, um, what, the, what, what the heck, you know, let's, 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 let's sell out, let's have uh, Calvin and Hobbes, lunchboxes, action figures, statuettes. Mm-hmm. You know, he, if he did that, I would 100% respect mm-hmm. his decision, but um, right now he's, he says, the strip is the strip. That's mm-hmm. that's the final word on it, and I, yeah, I, I really respect that. Yeah, and I respect that too. I mean, kudos for that of just allowing the strips itself to be the only amount of merchandise that you can mm-hmm. give for your customers who want even more than that. Mm-hmm. So you know what? I mean, he could have easily said, yeah, let's just do some toys and some action figures and some sponsorships or something like that. But no, he stuck to his guns and he said, nope, it won't go any further than just the collections. And you know what? Good on him. I want to thank you guys so much for coming on by to the podcast. I really do. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Anytime we can talk comics we're up for it oh yeah for sure um i'll probably need to invite you over for a future podcast to talk about more comics uh, I, I i enjoy doing this especially since i don't get to do this very often i think this is actually the first podcast i've been doing this podcast for uh let's see it started in 2012 so you know almost nine years and this is the first time that i actually talked about a comic strip series so this is great <laughs> oh that's cool yeah, so uh, what a way to start off 2021 to cover something that I haven't talked about. So that's great. So, yeah, uh, why don't you guys uh, talk about any upcoming projects that you're doing, uh, plug and promote your stuff. What do you guys got? Well, like I said at the at the top, uh, my first graphic novel, um, The Dire Days of Willow Weep Manor uh, with uh, Chris Baldwin, is going to be out this spring from Simon & Schuster. And mm-hmm. I'm very excited about it. I wrote it um, with Chris, and then he drew it. And um, I'm very very happy to finally see it come out it kind of got pushed back for a while because of covid right like upending the entire publishing industry so i'm very happy um and um, i do a daily comic strip online skin horse which i think is going into its last year now i think this year is going to be the last one i do that with a co-writer jeff wells and it's been going on for over 10 years now wow (laughs) oh yeah this one's pretty pretty long and I think we're getting near the end of the story. It's got a big story arc. I think we're actually getting to the end. So that will be probably ending sometime this year. Well, good for you. Congratulations. Thank you. Let's see, I've got, um, yeah, let's see, I, I uh, just had a book come out in November uh, on DC Comics and Sideshow Collectibles. So I've, um, yeah, that's uh, that was published by Insight Editions, uh, DC Collecting the Multiverse, <laughs> uh, and I've got um, yeah another another book or two with with sideshow collectibles and Insight coming up uh, in the coming year. 
uh, as far as the Cartoon Art Museum goes, we are currently closed to the public. So we're working on online programming and events. Um, so I'm actually talking to some animation, animation people and comic strip people right now about uh, some upcoming video presentations. And if you check out cartoonart.org, you can keep up with everything uh, that we're doing there while we wait for the, the green light from California and San Francisco to, to reopen. But that's all, you know, as they say, subject to change. So we're, we're all <laughs> just hanging in there. Right, right. And uh, yeah, as for me, uh, you can check out my podcast at Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Radio Public, Stitchers, and many other places. Uh, new episodes of my podcast, Casual Chats and Old School Lane Interviews will go over there first, and then it'll go up in a few days on YouTube. So thank you so much for listening, everyone. Uh, let us know in the comments below about your thoughts on Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, what was your favorite strip? Who were your favorite characters? What was your favorite moment? And uh, uh, tell us some other things about uh, Calvin and Hobbes that we didn't mention, such as as the documentaries of uh, Calvin and Hobbes, such as Dear Mr. Watterson, and um, even some of the references on various uh, animated shows and movies, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> anyway, yeah, so watch, yeah. You watch Dear Mr. Watterson, I, I'm, uh, I'm in there. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Well, that's it, everyone. Hope to see you around soon. Uh, let's, start, let's start 2021 on a high note, and thank you for listening. <laughs>